Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. Alyssa was always out there in the U.S. sailing fleet as like a whispered thing. It's like, oh, Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa. It's like she existed, but no one really knew anything about it. No one goes to Texas. And Alyssa was one of the early progenitors of the tall ship industry in the United States. She now is the second oldest actively sailed ship in the world. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Galveston Unscripted. In this episode, we sit down with the port captain of the Galveston Historical Foundation, Mark Sabinico. Mark has overseen the 1877 tall ship Alyssa for nearly a decade. If there's anyone alive today who knows more about the 1877 tall ship Alyssa, we haven't found them yet. Mark and I sit down and discuss 145 years of the history and operations of the tall ship Alyssa and how the world's second oldest actively sailed sailing vessel ended up in Galveston, Texas. Mark and I also dive into the Ship to Shore exhibit at the Galveston Historic Seaport, presented by the Galveston Historical Foundation. We discuss life in early Galveston, immigration, the importance of the Port of Galveston, and what it would have been like arriving here in the late 1800s or early 1900s. We also discuss Mark's life at sea and how he climbed the ranks on multiple tall ships to become a captain. You do not want to miss a minute of this action-packed episode, fueled by IPA, iron, cigarette smuggling, and mutiny. For a bit of context, the 1877 tall ship Alyssa was built in Aberdeen, Scotland. You guessed it, in the year 1877. The hull of the vessel was originally made of iron, and most of it remains intact today. After a long life of sailing the open seas, the tall ship Alyssa was rescued by the Galveston Historical Foundation after it was found in Greece, sitting at a dock and doing pretty much nothing. I'll let the director of the Galveston Historic Seaport and port captain of the Galveston Historical Foundation tell you the rest of the story. Let's jump right into this episode, discussing the history of the 1877 tall ship Alyssa with Captain Mark Sabinico. The wire goes on the left side. The little wired side is left side. You can do it on the right. That's fine. You're, oh, your port side. Sorry. You don't know your right and left, but you know your port and starboard. Would all the Michaels please stand up? Thank you. That concludes the mic check. <laughs> yeah, have you ever been on a podcast before? Uh, not this intense. Oh, I like to make it seem real legit. This is intense. There's like a microphone in my face. Yeah. I feel like I'm on a radio show. Yeah, well, hey, I sound like I'm in a radio show. Yeah. I sound like Barry White. You, uh, you know where Ooh, he's from? Galveston. He's of course. From Galveston. Yeah, right. Duh. <laughs> You're really good at this. You you might want to think about doing this. And like, I went to the school and it was really good. And I'd write you a letter of rec if you wanted to figure it out. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I, fast forward, I went to the CIA. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mark Sabinico. 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 I always like scissors. I always put the Okay. Scissors. Sabinico. Sabinico. Science. Sabinico. I am the port captain and director of Galveston Historic Seaport for Galveston Historical Foundation. I am a consummate mariner, wackadoodle professional boat person. I have very strange hobbies and I like sailing ships. How's that? That's perfect. You're doing pretty good. I love that. Yeah. Full disclosure, uh, not only do I work for the Alyssa, I'm also on the board now of Tall Ships America, which is a national organization for connecting tall ships around the United States. I've been doing that for a little over a year. I have a couple year term there. So clearly I'm a passionate advocate for the purpose. What are we drinking right now, Mark? This is Alyssa IPA. It's an IPA style that is storied to go with tall ships, even though that history is a little circumspect. Uh, but uh, St. Arnold's Brewery developed this with Galveston Historical Foundation a number of years ago. And uh, they, <laughs> they do give us a small percentage of the sales that go for it. So we, we, we enjoy it. And it's actually a good IPA. It's like nothing else. It's, it's amazing. A, it's a classic bitter IPA. They're not real popular these days. You know, they're made to sustain long sea voyages. You can dig into the history of IPAs later. That's definitely not my forte. So what kind of strange hobbies outside of the Alyssa? So one of my biggest recreational hobbies is a ancient board game called Go. Uh, I started playing Go in high school when I was a junior in high school. A friend of mine and I watched a art film called Pi, which is a cool black and white film about math and science. 
Uh, and it incorporates this old board game called Go, and we got obsessed with it, and we looked it up in the early days of the internet, you know, like AOL now. And uh, we built ourselves a board out of a piece of plywood and some pennies that we painted, and there was a local Go club that we joined, and uh, I've never stopped. You know when I found out that I loved math? I was sailing up the Oregon coast in 2008 on the Lady Washington, which is a wooden brig, and uh, I was being taught some near coastal navigation. And uh, I learned that if you knew how tall the lighthouse was and you took an angular measurement to the lighthouse from a sextant, you could tell how far away from the shore you were so you didn't crash and die. I was like, this is the coolest thing I've ever learned in my life. Is that the Pythagorean theorem or is it yeah, completely? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quite literally. But so in a real world context, right? Like the yeah. chart tells you how tall the lighthouse is. You can use a sextant to give you the angle, and then that will tell you how far away you are from it. You know your distance offshore. Yeah. And then if you travel another, like, 10 nautical miles north of that, and then you repeat that exercise, you can then add those two pieces together, and you can get a relative running fix of where you are. Is that a standard practice that Absolutely. is used in sailing? Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's in all the Merchant Mariner tests. I am the port captain for Galveston Historical Foundation, and I am the director of Galveston Historic Seaport for Galveston Historical Foundation. So who do you have captaining the vessel when you do the day sales and things like that? So the last couple of years, we've hired in a man named John Svensson, who's an old friend of mine, who is currently serving as master of Sea Cloud, which is a historical yacht uh, that does Mediterranean trips and um, Caribbean trips, a uh, yacht built in 1913 that was converted to the passenger trade thing. He and I have been tall ship friends for a long time since I've been in this business for a long time. And the joke I came up with a few years ago, because people always ask me, Captain Alyssa, Captain Alyssa, I said, you know, I, I just own the ship. I don't drive it. I pay someone else to drive it. And, and the reality is, is that, um, as you know, being a mariner and from a mariner background, in order to be the master of a vessel, your sole focus must be the safe operation of the vessel. And in the Houston Ship Channel and in the Galveston Ship Channel and here with all the traffic we have and the complexity of a going to be 145-year-old single screw tall ship, if I were to captain the vessel, I couldn't shake anybody's hand or have any conversation. So there are different roles. It is true in some facets that I am the captain of the Alyssa because when we're not running under operation with a hired in captain, I do fulfill that role. I keep track of all the paperwork. I run the crew training. I deal with basically all the things that you would do as a vessel captain. We're just tied at the dock. So I'm not docking the boat every day. That's really the only difference. I started working for Galveston Historical Foundation in September of 2012. So it's been a while. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're almost at your decade mark. That's right. So through my sailing adventures, I had gotten pretty deep in the American tall ship industry, which is its own weird little microcosm. Alyssa was always out there in the U.S. sailing fleet as like a whispered thing. It was like, oh, Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa. It was like she existed, but no one really knew anything about it. No one goes to Texas, not in the rest of the country, yeah, no. right? Like the Texas Gulf Coast is a completely unknown thing. And Alyssa, come to find out, I know a lot more now than I did before I came here, was one of the early progenitors of the tall ship industry in the United States. The Alyssa Restoration Project that really got started in Greece in like 75, 76, 77 in there is a crazy, crazy story. And when Galveston Historical Foundation got involved, it really wasn't until like 77, 78, uh, they didn't really know what they were getting into. They didn't understand how much money it was going to take. Uh, and the fact that they managed to get enough money to get it done is one of those strange stories here between backers in Houston and backers in Galveston and part of the whole Galveston secret hidden millionaire story that's going on, right? Because the money it took was obscene. Millions of dollars in 1979 dollars. Like no rational person would have done this. It was ironically enough modeled in some ways after Baltimore's Inner Harbor. So I'm a Maryland native. I grew up in Elkton, Maryland. My grandfather moved there from Boston in like 1948, post-World War II. My father grew up there. I grew up there. And so Baltimore had 
one of the first ideas to take what was a working waterfront that had lost most of its commercial appeal and to convert it into a tourist attraction. That's who you get Baltimore's inner harbor. But the pride of Baltimore, the original pride of Baltimore, was one of the cornerstones of that piece. So the pride of Baltimore in like 78, 79, and then Alyssa, 78, 79, are two of the first resurgences of traditional sail in the United States. And it's a little known piece of history that people don't know. And those programs about sail training and teaching people how to sail traditional vessels really catapult a bunch of the American traditional sail training program. Because sailing gets this big revival in the 70s, post-Kennedy and the 60s, you know, this like sailing for everyone, not just for the elite, not just for the America's Cup kind of deal. Bride of Baltimore is a replica Baltimore schooner. She sank, oh, don't know the right oh, date. I should. Okay. Bride of Baltimore 2 is the second build of that that's currently sailing. Also a replica Baltimore Clipper. They are square topsail schooners that were known as rum runners and privateers, uh, very predominant in the War of 1812, running blockades and uh, campaigns and privateer and military campaigns, fast, elite, clean schooners. None of the originals exist because they were built to be sailed until they fell apart, which is what they did. Alyssa is a true and true cargo ship launched in 1877. And she now is the second oldest actively sailed ship in the world. I have to ask, who's the first? James Craig in Australia. James okay. Craig is about a year or two prior to us, almost the same configuration, a little bit larger. I don't know a lot about their details. I've done a little bit of outreach to them, but you know, the time zones are big. They're day yeah, ahead. True. And they're also funded by the country of Australia. So they have a whole different paradigm, whole different setup. So the Alyssa is the oldest currently active sailing ship in the United States, for sure. That is correct. So the only other vessel that is close in age is the Star of India, which is in San Diego, California. They do a wonderful job with her there. She's a beautiful vessel, incredible. Incredible design, very different operating model than us. And they have a lot of other vessels that they interpret there through the San Diego Maritime Museum. Completely different deal. So uh, Alyssa is built in Aberdeen, Scotland. She's what's called a Clyde-built square rigger. Aberdeen is a famous shipbuilding area. She was built at Aberdeen Hall & Co., which was still in business up until like the 60s or later under another name. Uh, and she's hall number 294. And boy, she's awesome. She turns 145 years old this year. The second oldest sailing ship in the world. The oldest sailing ship in the United States. How many other names has she sailed as? Alyssa launched 1877. Sold to the Finns. Fjeld. Sold to the Swedes. Gustav. Then Gustav for a long time. Then sold to the Greeks. Uh, Achaios. Then renamed Christophoros, then set for scrap, then renamed Alyssa by GHF. So we've got built in Aberdeen, Scotland. We've got a few of the names. What kind of cargo did she carry and where did she travel normally? So cargo was very mixed. Henry Fowler Watt was the builder. He was an eccentric, of course, uh, loved ships and horses, of course, poured most of his money into sailing ships, of course, was also the master a few times of several of the trips. He had the idea that Alyssa would be a pickup cargo vessel. She's actually a small ship for her era, uh, 600 deadweight tons. And so she would carry anything that you would be able to pick up, kind of like a tramp steamer. So, for instance, in 1883, she came here to Galveston with uh, a load of bananas, and then she left with a load of cotton. And we know that from newspaper records here. And she was here again in 1886, uh, empty because she actually had sailed through the 1886 hurricane in order to get here and there was no cargo to be found in port and she left empty uh, and then she went to Pensacola, Florida and she picked up a load of lumber to sail to South America, an ironic twist of what used to be the trade routes of the United States. Uh, you imagine these day and age taking lumber from America to South America. It's just as bizarre as you get. But we know that th those are fact pieces. So what's great about the Brits is that uh, once you're registered as a British class vessel, they track you forever. 
So we have her class records, her load line records, her cargo records, all the way back to 1877. I know the vast majority of cargo that she carried all the way through the 1870s, 1880s, 1900s, 1910s. She was listed as missing for one year during World War I. Then uh, she spent the bulk of her life in the Baltic Sea, uh, running through Norway, Sweden, Finland, England, Germany, a few of those, runs back and forth between the Mediterranean, did a bunch of runs between um, North America, South America, timber trade routes, Atlantic trade routes, and then uh, one or two trips to Valparaiso, probably for coal or for nitrates. She was definitely a coal carrier at certain points. Uh, one trip out to the East Asia area, but mostly uh, Mid-Atlantic, North and South Americas, and then uh, Baltic and surrounding seas, North Seas. What's the most interesting type of cargo that you've seen that she's carried? Probably coal. Coal, yeah. So coal, yeah, because, I mean, you think about, like, how they would load that in there. I mean, was it bagged back then? No, she actually has coal ports built into the hull. I can show you where they are. So there are these mechanical fastening ports. They're about uh, six to eight inches tall by six to eight inches wide, and they have these buckling pieces that fasten them in. And so they undo them, and then they set a chute in, and then they just pour it into the hold while people in the hold rake it out over the bounding places. Gotcha. Were those There's retrofitted? Side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I don't know when they were first put in there, but I would guess early 1900s. Okay, gotcha. But you're, you're, you're in that time period, right? So like 1877, I mean, you're in the Industrial Revolution, you're dealing with large things, coal is taking over, steamships are starting to be able to um, sail more than they can burn, which was the big turnover, you know, the ability for engines to be efficient enough that they didn't have to carry, their, their cargo hold didn't have to just be their fuel, that was the turning point. You know, it's it's funny to think about the Industrial Revolution that way, is when a ship can sail more efficiently with like a cargo on board than it's actually burning. That's really the shift. Absolutely. It's like how much more can you give than you're taking, right? So it's fascinating to think about the Industrial Revolution in that way and technology in that way. You got a representative right down here. It is the coolest piece of maritime history in the United States, right here in Galveston, Texas, at the Galveston Historic Seaport at Pier 22, Suite Number 8. Come down and visit us. Do you know anything more about when the Alyssa came here in 1883 and 1886? Anything else that went on? So those are the only two times that it was here. Tenuous ties at best. So when... Galveston Historical Foundation was pursuing the vessel. It was really proposed to them by some other outside interests. There's a guy named Peter Throckmorton, who you can look up as a just unbelievable maritime archaeologist, who's the person who discovered Alyssa. It's a wild story. He had seen her in the Mediterranean and had realized, even with all of her uh, scantlings struck, no bowsprit, no sails, just a cargo loading crane. By the shape, he thought that she was a traditional sailing ship. And he was heavily involved in uh, San Francisco Maritime Museum, uh, a big advocate for uh, traditional sail in the United States. And he talked his way on board in this Greek yard when she was still operating and said, I really think this is a sailing ship. And the Greek captain was like, oh, yeah, yeah, she is. And she had the builder's plate down below, which is the hull number 294. And that catapulted him to start figuring out how to do it. He actually purchased the vessel um, using some other foreign investments. He hid the fact that they were American investments, so the Greeks didn't hike the price. They thought he was buying it for scrap value. Uh, and then he went on a campaign to find an entity to purchase and restore the vessel. And she actually was going to go several different places. He was looking for her to go to San Francisco. She was going to go to, go to Victoria, Canada. Uh, and so Galveston at the time, we talked touched upon this earlier, was looking at sort of revitalizing their very small downtown waterfront area. And there was some discussion about building a replica vessel of John Lafitte's pirate ship because people like pirates, even though they're terrible, horrible people that should never be taught about in anything other than history books. Through some chance meetings with some people, Polly Guido got involved, who's big down here. Michael Kramer got involved, who was involved in the earlier restoration days. And they said, you're going to, and this is in one of GHF's videos, you can find it on one of the documentaries, they said, you're going to have a thousand years to build a replica. You have the opportunity to save a true sailing ship now. So you should do it. And because she called here twice, it was enough. It was a real tenuous tie, but it was enough 
that they connected to it and yeah. went for the restoration effort. When the Alyssa would show up, you had a crew on board. Now, when you showed up at a port in Europe or a port in South America, or wherever the Alyssa would call, would the crew on board, would they actually discharge and load the cargo or were there always longshoremen? So I don't know about lots of other countries. Uh, and that's an interesting point. But I know in the U.S. that there were longshoremen companies that were designed for all of that purpose. I know in smaller ports, it would be the ship's crew itself. And the ship's crew itself was still doing it all the way up until today in some places, because there are still some cargo loading vessels that can unload their own cargo where the shoreside infrastructure doesn't exist. Yeah, I think it all depends on what port you show up in, what contracts are in place. Those are agreements between the shipping agents and the facility in the port. Here's a fun another soundbite for you. So when I first started getting into the maritime administration side of pieces of Alyssa, uh, I had to start getting vested in understanding the details of the insurance of a historic vessel. Maritime insurance is the origin of insurance in the world. So our insurance, as all other ships I have found out's insurance, carry such caveats in their policies to wit seizure by foreign empires, capture by persons under the operation of letter of mark, like anachronistic language that you would think was from like a sci-fi novel is in modern day shipping insurance pieces. Like you can get a vessel that was built in 2020 and it probably has a policy exemption that if it is seized by a foreign government under a letter of mark that they're not insured. And it's like, how do you still have this in here? <laughs> Cause it happens. It happens. You know, I, one thing I'd like to bring up, but history feels so far away. It feels like it was so long ago, but where we're sitting right now, we can look at some of these buildings. Some of these buildings that we're looking at right now were here when the Alyssa showed up in 1883. Yeah. Anyway. So you just think about stuff like that and like how, the history of the world and the way things were happening all over the world and how it ties back to the port that is less than 200 yards away from us right now. So I understand there was a mutiny on the Alyssa at some there point. There was. So in broad terms, Henry Fowler Watt, who was the builder and owner of the vessel, who also sailed as master, very eccentric dude. We've actually had some contact with his family that still live in England. Really interesting group of folks. Apparently, allegedly, one of his officers uh, got into arguments with Watt about various policies, procedures. He thought that things weren't being done correctly. So England, to this day, one of my favorite things ever, all the way back to uh, Sir Francis Drake, the authority of the master afloat is absolute. And there's lots of reasons why. But... Watt basically decided that this gentleman was off his rocker, questioning his authority, straight up told him, you're relieved of your duties, you can find your quarters, bread and water, as you would read in any kind of, you know, wild story about maritime sailing days. And so this guy agreed, he complied, because you had to, absolute authority. Of the well, he'd been thrown day. overboard. So according to him... Because there are some court proceedings that can be looked up for this. He thought that the ship was being stood into danger, meaning that he needed to come onto deck to assist in taking in sail or steering or whatever. Only Watt didn't feel the same uh, and thought that he was violating the terms of his confinement to port. He claimed, Watt claimed, that this person charged him with a capstan bar and he shot him in the leg. Shot him in the leg, on board. They attended to his wound. They got him all cleaned up. Uh, he lived. They got back to port. They discharged him. The guy filed official charges in British court. Uh, and Watt was acquitted of all charges. He was basically determined that he was well within his right to stand that man down and then to shoot that man in the leg for violating his orders underway. Real deal. True story. Now, is that because the captain basically has the final say? Absolute authority. Absolute authority on that 
on that vessel. So if he says, we're going to sail this vessel this way, there's a storm coming, but it's my my whole directive. We're going this way. And if anyone questions him, he can he has the authority. So it's a big deal these days because uh, the language has been tailored a little bit. You still swear an oath in the United States Merchant Marine when you get your initial papers, your ordinary seaman's papers. But the oath you now swear states that you will agree to follow and obey the legal and lawful orders of the master. And that language was put in place to stop complete rampant craziness. Uh, But it has been a big challenge over the years in the maritime world about when you can actually legally question the master's decision. And whose laws? Is it depending on where you are? It's your country of flag that you sail under. That's right. You know, there's been some things in the last few years. Uh, El Faro sinking is an example, sailing into a hurricane, um, about where those lines are drawn and what kind of pressures the chief mate is under, whether he can question the master's decisions or not. Uh, There's some real challenges there. The FAA in flying has dealt with this a fair amount. Uh, They had some real serious issues where they killed a lot of people. Um, because of dramatic action being taken by the master of the plane. Uh, only those things happen much faster than a lot of sailing actions happen. So there's there's still some pieces of that puzzle to solve. Yeah. Uh, but you got to think about it. Um, ships do not sail by committee, and they can't. It can't operate that way. Yeah. It has to have a militaristic structure, even though it's a civilian environment, because mm-hmm. uh, there's too many decisions, too many lives at risk. And you can take input from the team, but at some point, someone has to be responsible to make the decision because you don't have the luxury of being in a legal office. You're in a uh, dynamic environment where a decision must be made because to do nothing is the same as to die. A vessel is not a democracy. In lots of ways, it can't be. It needs to be an informed decision-making process, but... It can't be a true democracy because, again, you don't you don't have the luxury of time. Democracy requires the ability to have long, drawn out discussions. And when there are 60 to 80 not wins approaching you, some decisions have to be made. Even if you have had a couple days beforehand to discuss it, decisions have to happen. Can you tell me about the ship to shore experience? Galveston Historical Foundation had been working for a long time on the Galveston History Project, which is an endeavor to do research into the lives of Galvestonians, the history of Galveston itself. Uh, it's fairly broad. It encompasses a lot of different epochs of Galveston's history. Galveston, as you might understand, becomes a really viable port post the Deepwater Jubilee in the late 1800s when they deepened the Galveston Ship Channel. Uh, It's a very shallow port before that. And so out of that came the highlighting of the immigration story, which is known locally, but isn't really known very well nationally or internationally. And so Galveston saw immigration numbers close as you can get in the U.S. to the Ellis Island influx and the Boston influxes. German immigration basically bypassed much of the rest of the country and came in through Texas. It's a, it's a high amount of immigration through the port, as well as commerce and everything else. At one point, Galveston was known as the Wall Street of the South. And in fact, where we're sitting kitty corner to this building here, or catty corner, depending upon where you're from in the U.S., is what was known as the old Cotton Exchange Building. And so cotton was traded like Wall Street. Stocks were traded here in this area. So the ship-to-shore experience at Galveston Historic Seaport, out of the Galveston History Project, is designed to tell the story of Galveston from about 1880-ish through the 1900s pre the storm story here. And it's about immigration through the port, pushing folks out into the farther territories of Texas, developing farming agriculture, longshoremen unions, local wealth, grown wealth through unions, as we've talked about a little bit, some of the first biracial unions in the area. And it's really interesting 
immersive interactive experience. And the idea is to transition away from the concept of a maritime museum, which often has no focus and tries to broadly tell the maritime story of like 3,000 years, which is impossible, and to target it to the Alyssa time frame, the Galveston time frame, the 1870s through the 1900s, and to kind of showcase what it was like here, what the immigration was through visual storytelling and like graphic novel style in an experience. So we call it the ship to shore experience for you to see what happens here. As you walk through, you basically have a choice. You can choose someone's story to follow and follow their story from Making your way across by ship, down below decks, above decks, and then out into town. What fascinates me, so you have this big German Eastern European immigration piece, which is a lot of the stories in the journals. What's cool about the experience is that they're all real stories. Nothing is fabricated other than the imagery and the storytelling, because we don't have the photographs or, you know, they obviously didn't have quality video cameras. So taken from real people's journal entries. And I didn't think about it until I started listening to the deluge of journals, almost to a person in the arrival piece from the Eastern European fashion. They all state in one fashion or another, I cannot believe how hot it is here. The heat is so oppressive. And when you think about that, because if you imagine if you came from like the Black Forest in Germany and you didn't even know that this mosquito infested swamp hell existed and suddenly you are transported on a slow roll across the Atlantic into this midsummer hellhole, of course it must be miserable, right? Like you must just mention like, what have I done? Like... And we joke about it because like, well, you know, like I'll take a flight back to Maryland instant travel 500 miles an hour but when you come back you walk out of the airport it's like stepping into a dog's mouth like it's oppressive the heat and the sweat and you're just like can you imagine if you hadn't even you hadn't even seen an article in the newspaper about how terrible it was you just showed up and it was horrid you were like what have i done i'm in america oh wait desperate for water because it's 110 degrees and they're just discharged onto this mosquito infested swamp which like like, let's face it galveston is a salt uh, marsh uh, we're barrier island it's a sandbar can we talk about your sailing experience yeah sure let's do it let's do it man so where how did you get started in uh, with sailing how'd you get interested in that how much time do we have i realized very quickly that uh with a high school diploma your options are bupkis Uh, And I got a couple jobs washing dishes in local restaurants. I spent my like 18, 19, 20 uh, washing dishes to make rent, you know. And so I was working for one kitchen uh, in Newark, Delaware, which is right in my hometown right there, the tri-state area, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania. And uh, they had a guy cancel and they were like, oh, no one can make the soup. You want to learn how to make the soup? And I was like, yeah, cool. I'll learn how to do that. And, you know, give it a year, and I was running that kitchen. I was the kitchen manager for that restaurant. I had learned all the stations. I had been making salads. I, you know, I was like, man, I I jibe with this, right? Like, this works for me. It's a trade skill. I feel good at this. And the guy who ran the restaurant had been a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York. The good old CIA. That's right. And so he said... uh, uh, you're really good at this. You you might want to think about doing this. And like, I went to the school and it was really good. And I'd write you a letter of rec if you wanted to figure it out. I was like, yeah, let's do it. Uh, so I, fast forward, I went to the CIA. <laughs> yeah, which is, a, which is a two-year program. It's a trade school deal. Uh, long and involved. There's a whole other podcast about my experiences becoming a professional chef. Uh, and then there was an opportunity for you to apply to be a teaching assistant. And I did. And I was accepted. So I spent a year there getting paid. Uh, yeah. Enough, enough to pay rent, you know. I mean, it wasn't terrible. And uh, six months in the butchery shop, fab shop, and then six months in the fish kitchen. This guy named Corky Clark was the fishmonger, and he was this wildcat, old Navy dude, big USN anchor tattoos on his arms. He had all these like iconic sayings, and he drove stuff into students. He was a really great, well meaning individual. Uh, and so I think I was probably like his. 30th TA, you know, like, cause you know, everybody does like a year, whatever it was. And so when I got done, I had two job offers. I had a job offer in Scotland at a three-star Michelin restaurant. And then I had a job offer at a small passenger cruise ship in South America. And I was talking to chef Corky Clark and I was like, chef, I, what should I do? You know, I, I guess I was 21 or 22 at the time. 
And this guy says, well, Mark, I don't know why. And he just like puts his fist in the table. And he's got this USN anchor tattoo. He says, young man, you wouldn't want to go to sea. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I guess that's a good idea. I guess I should go do that. So fast forward. And before I know it, I'm on a plane. I'm getting flown to the Falkland Islands. Yeah. Uh, we get underway and we're bound south for the Antarctic Peninsula. <laughs> <laughs> It was a 350-foot converted Russian icebreaker. We did 80 passengers. Yeah, so I sailed and traveled and worked all through South America, Brazil, Guyana, French Guyana, Suriname, Trinidad. So I get down and go home. I'm staying at my dad's place, and uh, they wanted me to come back for another hitch. But it was rough, man. It was hard. It was hard work. Uh, I enjoyed the travel. I didn't really love the work. Um, I wasn't feeling the culinary piece on board, you know. I said to them, they wanted me back, and I said, uh, no, I'm not going to do this. I can't do this. I'm sorry. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm not coming back. Uh, and so I started looking on the internet, you know, like available jobs, and there was a tall ship on the West Coast, Grays Harbor Historical, uh, called the Lady Washington, and they were looking for a cook. And they had, you know, basic job description and uh, they were looking for someone that had good culinary skills and any kind of time afloat. Uh, So I applied and they hired me like the next day. Come to find out later, I was like probably tall ship gold mine. I had been cooking for 80 passengers a day for months on end. And I went to work for the Lady Washington and I was cooking for like 10 people a day. Oh my God. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. I blew their socks off. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wait, I only have to do one eighth of the work right now. But it was room and board. Yeah. Who cared? Right. Like, I'm still young. And you're living at sea, basically, right? Or not at sea, but. You know, I didn't have any real earthly possessions. I didn't have a car. I didn't have, like, I didn't have a dresser. You know, I just threw my shit in a backpack and I got on the boat. It was great. And then I spent the next. 2007 or so till 2012, traveling from boat to boat to boat. I did a bunch of tall ship work. Um, The cooking was so easy to do. I wanted out of the galley because I'd been learning how to do all the ropes and the furling the square soles. And I was more interested in the deck side of things. And I became a deck hand. And then I just like ran the rabbit, you know, yeah, got the merchant mariner credential. I got my AB and, uh, Long Beach, California. I got my 100 ton in Baltimore. I got my 500 ton. And then I got on board a wooden brig from the late 1780s. I spent the next few years sailing up and down the West Coast on historic traditional sailing ships. And then I got an opportunity. Some friends of mine were taking a vessel called the Lynx, which was uh, is working on the East Coast now. It was here in Galveston in 2018, Square Stopsail Schooner. And they said, we're moving the operations to Florida. We need some people to take this boat through the Panama Canal. And I was like, sign me in. So I sailed her from California back to Florida. Then I got on board another sailing ship, the Pride of Baltimore, sailed all through the Great Lakes, got as close to doing the Lewis and Clark thing that you can. So I I spent my 20s, uh, my late teens through my 20s, sailing around the world. Your favorite Galveston historic facts not related to the port? So I'm involved with the Masonic Lodge here. And uh, one of the guys, Roy Abbey Hughes, who was there for a long time, has since passed away. He would tell stories about the early mob days here in town in the like 30s, 40s, 50s. So I got interested and I've read a little bit about the history. And so some of the quotes that I have read that come out of this was like, well, they were mobsters. They were our mobsters. Like the most Texas thing on the planet. And apparently they ran Al Capone out. They basically told him, no, not here. Can't come here. And the whole Maceo Fertitta thing, like, I'm super fascinated by the whole Italian mob piece in Galveston history. So I want to learn more about that. But the fact that they were like, yeah, yeah, no, Al Capone, you can't come here. Like, we're just going to do our own gambling. And it's a legacy piece here, right? Because there's people still adamantly against gambling and for gambling and, like, all that stuff that happens here. So I think that's one of my favorite non-ship Galveston pieces is the whole mob run and scene. Oh, was the Alyssa actually used for cigarette smuggling? As far as we know, yes. So the story goes, whether it's true or not, was that she was smuggling cigarettes and probably a few other nefarious goods uh, through the Mediterranean under Greek ownership. And the way the legend is told, because this is early 70s, so no GPS, uh, no satellite imagery, radar, of course, and VHF radios. 
So apparently they were taking cardboard cutouts, probably plywood cutouts, to adjust the silhouette of the side of the ship. So she would look like a different vessel from a distance. And so they did that a few times and they got caught by the Greek authorities. And the Grecians basically said, hey, 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 we're on to you. You're running a legal trade. We catch you again. You're done. And that's when she went for scrap. Thank you for listening to Galveston Unscripted. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. I would like to express my immense gratitude to Captain Mark Sabinico and the Galveston Historical Foundation. And be sure to check out the Ship to Shore experience, only at the Galveston Historic Seaport at Pier 22, Suite Number 8. Come down and visit us. As you can see, Captain Mark Sabinico is an amazing storyteller. If you enjoyed this episode, please reach out to us on social media and let us know. Tell us what you thought about it. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. We're available on just about every podcast platform. Thanks to listeners like you. Galveston Unscripted is growing. Each episode receives more downloads than the last, and the location-based audio tour is used more and more every day. Thank you for helping me transform Galveston into the world's largest free museum and helping me spread historic resources throughout Galveston, Texas, and the United States. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted. Fun fact, my wife went and sailed on a Dutch ship across the Atlantic, and, uh... She was giving distances as a A, B on the bow, but they wanted it in meters. And she hadn't really done anything in meters. And then she realized that like a yard was basically the same thing. And she'd grown up doing Texas football. So she just would give distances in yards and it was equivalent to doing it in meters. She's like leaving South Africa, giving distances in Texas football yards. So it's equivalent to meters. Yeah, it's about three or 400 yards right there. (laughs) (laughs) Friday Night Lights, baby. For historic resources or more information, check out the episode description.